Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin, and each episode I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research, and their experiences. So, put your earphones in, turn the volume up, and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? Hello, you are about to listen to part two of an interview with Angela McRobbie. If you've yet to listen to part one, please do go back and listen to that. It's on the archives from August 2020, but you should have a listen to that one first, which is her early work and research in the mid 70s up to the 80s. And this part two will take up her work from the late 80s all the way up to the present day. And do remember that the Sociology Show podcast is brought to you as ever in association with Tutor to You Sociology, the exam performance specialist for A level and GC. CSE sociology students and teachers. And so if you would like to find out more, you can visit tutortoyou.net forward slash sociology. And there you can pick up revision guides, revision videos, flashcards, and everything else that you need for your A-level or GCSE sociology studies. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the Sociology Show podcast and I'm delighted to welcome back Angela McRobbie for the second part of her interviews. If you've yet to listen to part one then you should go back and listen to that one before this one where I interviewed Angela about her early research from the mid 70s to the late 80s on issues such as girls magazines, female subcultures and women in music and fashion. Angela welcome back to the show. Hi there. Firstly I should ask how are you? Uh, yeah, I am a lot better, thank goodness. I still have uh, the signs or the symptoms of long COVID, but there is progress and I definitely am improving. So I, so that's good. <laughs> Fantastic. How long ago was it when you first had COVID? It's nearly a year. Uh, I am now uh, round about almost, I got it at the end of February, the very, very end of February, uh, 2020. So it's really well over 10 months, really 11 months, in fact. Wow. So the name long COVID is very much justified then. Oh, completely. I mean, it absolutely exists. And it's kind of knocked me out throughout this period. But, you know, I am getting better. I no longer need to have respiratory therapy. I stopped that at Christmas. And I can go for long walks. And I can do a good bit of work every day, um, but I definitely would not be well enough, for example, to be doing a faculty job. That for sure I couldn't do. So I've, I've got kind of limited windows of energy but, and stamina, both for physical exercise and for my mental capacity. Hmm. Well, well, thank you very much for t- taking some time to uh, talk to me again today. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. <laughs> So, Angela, in, in part one of our interview, we just got up to your career to around about the late 80s. I think that's where we got to. So we're going to start from there and carry on to, to where you're up to now. So around the end of the late 80s, you're kind of, you went off in kind of two different pathways, if you like, with your research. Do you just want to describe or explain a bit about that? For sure. Um, the, I think at that time, the... Yeah, there were actually two or three pathways, but the first and possibly the most substantial in that it's the one where I can trace the continuities most clearly is the pathway that led me, if you like, today to being somebody who does extensive research on the creative economy, on uh, working conditions in the culture industries, with particular reference to fashion, but also more widely thinking about gender and the creative industries, thinking about intersectionality, class, race, and so on. So the link there, if I think back to, let's say, the mid-1980s, it's quite interesting for me to really uh, reconstruct that pathway because I think what really struck me most forcibly by the end of the 1980s was the way in which we might have just touched on this uh, briefly in the last interview, but it was the way in which, if you like, 
subcultural activity on the part of disenfranchised youth and particularly working class youth or young people on the margins of the lower end of the middle classes, upper end of the working classes. Uh, there was a sense in which subcultures were somehow being professionalized. There was a kind of codification of subcultural activity. It had become part of the university curriculum through a lot of the earlier Birmingham work. And that gave it not just a gravitas, but it gave it a certain kind of form of social capital that knowing and understanding the history of British post-war youth cultures and subcultures really entered into the mainstream of the academic curriculum. And at the same time as this was happening, the universities themselves, particularly the new universities, were beginning to open themselves up to a much wider constituency of entrants and of school leavers from more diverse backgrounds and from more working class backgrounds. And what one saw between the late the mid to late 80s and let's say the mid to late 90s, then particularly when Tony Blair came to office in 97, this was really then, if you like, certificated and consolidated. But what one saw at that time from the late 80s through the early 90s was a series of uh, avenues and pathways often under uh, left-wing Labour administration, city councils, which offered avenues of um, access to disadvantaged young people into the universities, particularly into the art schools, into art and design and fashion and film and multimedia. And uh, this was in a lead up to what then became known as the post-92 universities. So this was still at the time of the polytechnic. So the polytechnics were widening the range of young people going to university. They were consolidating different pathways through different kinds of qualifications, not just the three A's, A level to get into the top universities. And yeah, as I mentioned, there were also various um, forms of support to disadvantaged students. And a very good example of that um, is the kind of support through youth centres, through mentorships, through uh, a kind of local community activities that allowed many of the, what we would now call, they're not, no longer quite so young, but what came to be known as the young black and Asian artists. Most of them, including, for example, the, the uh, film director, Steve McQueen, entered university through these kinds of, um, of pathways. Uh, another person being Isaac Julian. And there were a whole range of uh, black and Asian young people from much more diverse backgrounds who entered into the university system and alongside them were their white counterparts and the white counterparts, many of them had lived and had experienced and were full of ideas, particularly students entering graphic design courses at places like London College of Communications. So they kind of gave a much bigger mix to the polytechnics and they also were often very extremely interested sociologically or artistically or visually in these kind of youth subcultures. So what I mean is that youth subcultures became consolidated and professionalized and became part of the curriculum. And that to me then also took place at the same time, if you like, in quite a kind of classic Bordeauxian fashion, that new jobs were opening up in the fashion, media, music industries. And these jobs required uh, what Bourdieu would, re would refer to as culture intermediaries. And so there was a kind of link between this pathway where young people were no longer outside the university, outside the degree system, but were inside it. And then were, if you like, either creating their own jobs or entering into the fashion and magazine and music industries, what we would now call the creative industries. 
So that then led me to sum up, to, 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 to uh, sum up my thinking then. What I was arguing was that a background like this, interested in fashion, music, art, in the popular art sense, if you like, that, that Stuart Hall would refer to it, became, in a sense, created a, lab- a labour market. It became a labour market. And that labour market, up until Tony Blair came into office, was relatively informal. It was known about, it was kind of based on tacit knowledge, and it, it, it combined both formal and informal elements. So the informal elements were, for example, fashion designers leaving college, setting up their own stalls, making clothes at home, selling them in Camden Market, in relation to the music industry, we see similar kinds of practices going on. So this really led to an explosion, if you like, uh, of a new creative economy before the politicians kind of jumped on the bandwagon. So there is a line of interest sociologically that I can trace between my early interest in, for example, girls and subcultures, then my interest in the way in which, instead of just consuming the music or consuming the clothes, young people not just were producing, they weren't just becoming cultural producers, but they were actually generating a kind of sector of the economy. They were generating what then became known as the cultural economy. So during this time, I think the, there were a number of things that I was writing, but relevant to this discussion, the most significant, there were, there were two or three articles. One was an article that is published in the Subcultures Reader, edited by um, my good friend Sarah Thornton and Ken Gelder. And it was called Second Hand Dresses and the Role of the Rag Market. And this really kind of confirmed my interest. Of course, it was mostly young women. And I was interested in making clothes, making vintage clothes, uh, dry cleaning them, reselling them, uh, obviously uh, with a certain kind of environmental interest. But it was also very much about taking older vintage items of clothing that were not seen as high fashion, that they weren't glamorous, they weren't conventional, and introducing them into, if you like, uh, a kind of um, market, rag market. So that article, I think, still has traction because at the time, I don't think Angela Carter, the writer, had written about vintage clothes, but I think I was probably in the UK the only sociologist that was actually interested, if you like, in the transactional and the productive dynamics of the second-hand rag market. And that came out of my observations first in Birmingham, um, in the Birmingham rag market and in the shops that had been springing up that often were providing clothes for people that were in the music scene and so on. But then also when I moved to London, of course, uh, Camden Market absolutely uh, has over many decades been a a real mecca for young people and for youth culture. So that was one article. But then during that same period, let's say, I think I began the work in the about 1992, and I really wanted to look in a more detailed way and in a way way that was informed by interviews and observation. And and the book that emerged, it didn't come out until 1998, but it was really finished by about 1996. So we're talking about the years from 1990 to 1996. And what I was interested in was the flurry of activity, the really spectacular, talented and wonderful work that young people were producing for these uh, urban uh, second-hand markets or urban street markets. And what was clear to me was that young people were coming out of arts and fashion school and had kind of embraced the post-punk DIY economy and were selling their clothes in all kinds of small shops, in uh, shared market spaces, in places like Chapel Market, in Islington, in Petticoat Lane, in Spitalfields, 
And there was a wonderful shop called Hyper Hyper in Kensington, which was really a kind of fashion hub, very interesting at the time, uh, subsidized by the local council. So there were, there were at that time, and this also relates and refers to the Black and Asian British artists, but the GLC at the time in London was a very progressive, left-wing, uh, labour-run council, and it was providing informal and formal uh, means of support to designers, including spaces and live-work units. So there was a very proactive urban cultural policy in place for those years. And what that then saw was this really explosion of talent that was quite remarkable. And the, the sort of people that I interviewed for the book, which was titled British Fashion Design, Rag Trade or Image Industry? Question mark. And many of the people I interviewed uh, for that book were really by then very well household names. They were people like Helen Story, Pam Hogg, and at that time I was also teaching myself um, in, uh, well, I had been teaching earlier actually in the 1980s at Central St. Martin. So I could sort of see, uh, I could see close up how this new emergent cultural economy was working. And uh, I then followed many of the students up after they had graduated and I visited them in their homes and in their studios. And I looked at the work and I, uh, I was also very interested in the history of the art schools and how fashion education had developed. So I interviewed a whole bunch of fashion educators and like, leading lights of the people who had set up the art and the fashion schools uh, in Central St. Martins and at the London College of Fashion. So I really enjoyed that, doing that work. And in many ways, it's what I'm still doing now, constantly updating, looking at fresh angles. But that's been an absolutely um, consistent theme in my own research over the, over the years, looking at the growth of what we might call fashion microeconomies. Because, yeah, you mentioned that, that British fashion design was late 90s, but it, it suggests both the sociology of fashion and a line of research into the sociology of creative labour and precarity today. Yes, absolutely. That's completely correct. That um, I think what I was doing, I must say, I was really very tentative when I was doing that work, again, because I felt really isolated. There weren't very many people at all uh, interested in livelihoods in culture and in the new cultural economy as it was developing and the people that I was talking to there were there were a, there was a small group of us and my two if you like uh, constant companions or interlocutors were both at the open university this is the time where uh, Stuart Hall was at, at the university and I was actually taking part in many seminars and groups with Stuart Hall at that time and uh, I did some work for the Open University about the fashion economy but there were very few people interested in labour and in livelihoods and in what it was like to be working in this sector. It was completely almost not considered as a, a topic and so it was really there were there were two other people that were if you like interest, sorry, there were three other people that were interested. Uh, old sociologist, Sean Nixon, who's now at Essex University, and uh, his work was really, really important and interesting. Uh, and um, Paul Dubé, also at the Open University then, and my colleague at Goldsmiths now, uh, Keith Negus, who did a parallel study of the music industry. So I would say the four of us were really working along the same lines with Stuart Hall in the background. And at that time, we were looking for the right kind of conceptual framework. And we were vacillating between Bourdieu and Foucault. And obviously, we, obviously we looked to Bourdieu for his sociology of culture and of uh, cultural production and his famous 1993 book on cultural production and his incredible studies, not only of distinction, but also his studies of writers and artists. And um, however, I would say towards, towards the end of uh, that period, we were 
Uh, this is an interesting point. I would say that Paul DeGay and John Nixon and myself and Stuart began to be interested in the idea of entrepreneurship and the idea of the entrepreneurial self. And that was very much because that was emerging from political culture at the time. And the idea of, during the Thatcher years, you know, get on your bike or develop it, encourage the entrepreneurial spirit. And so we were moving away from Bourdieu towards Foucault and Foucault's notion of technologies of the self and Foucault's notion of individualization and of uh, yes, um, self-organized labor. And so I would say towards the end of the 1990s, we were reading a lot of Foucault, and that then emerged as the most useful model for understanding these processes of, um, if you like, individualization processes and the way in which labour markets were becoming disaggregated and the way in which uh, labour and livelihoods were increasingly seen as projects and projects of the self or project working and uh, this and the, the rise of um, DIY labour markets but also the rise of freelance labour and of course that is exactly then what led me to the work that was published in 2016 but actually one of the key articles of that period, and it really summed up the issues. Uh, it was published in a special issue of Cultural Studies, edited by Sean Nixon, and I think Paul Duguay. And I think I think the issue was called "Who Are the Cultural Intermediaries Now?" And my article there was called "Club to Company," and I really enjoyed working on this article, "Club to Company," because it, it exactly the title summed up how I was interested in the way in which people who had been clubbing, who had, become, who had been DJs, then became, if you like, entrepreneurs of the self. And they became these leading lights in the new culture industries. And uh, I wanted uh, the, the kind of Marxist voice in me and the influence of Stuart Hall, the article Club to Company, and which was then reprinted in the book Be Creative, what I really wanted to do was to challenge what was a, a growing sense of romanticism of the creative economy. And the romanticism was coming from very different unexpected angles. Obviously, it was coming from the politicians and from Tony Blair, Charles Ledbetter, and so many others who were talking about, you know, this is a whole new world, a brave new world of the talent-led economy and uh, the, the joys and the pleasures of, as Charles Ledbetter's book was called, Living on Thin Air. And so there was a complete kind of romanticization of, you know, become the next Alexander McQueen or become the next um, TV chef or the next person who makes uh, wedding dresses for Princess Diana at that time. Um, so there was romanticism, but then I think there was also a kind of euphoria within certain sectors of the academy. There was a kind of excitement. Ah, oh, the new creative economy. And isn't this exciting? And it's very cool and it's very, it, it's, um, it's very cutting edge and it's uh, part of a kind of new, more equal capitalism, soft capitalism. And in that article, I just really said, in a nutshell, you know, Actually, you know, are you joking? Uh, because uh, the research that I was then doing, not just on fashion designers, but surveying the whole field, was showing all kinds of antisocial dimensions, new forms of social exclusion. And that where an informal job market appeared, where you got a job depending on being behind the bar at the Groucho or being in... Uh, you know, a trendy club in Dalston where everything was so informal and it was about who you knew, actually reproduced patterns of social exclusivity. And the kinds of people that were excluded from this job market were, for example, so let me put it this way, if the artist-led economy 
involves going to lots of launch parties and taking hands and being offered jobs, working, you know, going to the, the art parties, then people who couldn't go to those parties, even if they were incredibly talented and very hardworking and very interested and dynamic. But if you were, for example, a single parent or if you had care responsibilities, you couldn't possibly be going to parties three nights a week in the White Cube mm. in Toreditch uh, in the hope that you would then get one job offer and then another job offer. So I was, I was extremely critical of the informal labour market that was emerging. And I, I also uh, described the way in which, you know, this, this was a kind of eclipsing of all the progressive measures that feminists and anti-racists had introduced step by step in the 70s and through the 80s about panels, about equality, about anti-discrimination, about fairness and who gets a job. I mean, it was clear that uh, what was being reproduced was a kind of winner takes all. If you could be the kind of young woman who had enough resources to be out and about, to be in trendy places, great, maybe you would get a job as a curator. But I was really... Uh, pouring cold water by this point on the euphoria around the new creative economy. Yeah, and you, you mentioned, you know, you're influenced by Bourdieu and Foucault, but your work follows in so many ways the conceptual frames as defined by Stuart Hall, who you worked with, doesn't it? Absolutely. And, you know, I'm most indebted to Stuart. And I think that uh, both the feminist books, and so the, the, the other pathway that I have been consistently working on, I think it's true to say that my mind was blown uh, intellectually when I read Judith Butler's two books in 1990 and 1993. And, you know, I spent weeks just reading them and rereading them. And I think it was Judith Butler that really led me back into, in the most kind of immersive way, feminist theory. So I have to flag up Judith's work as well. But... Uh, with Stuart Hall, I think what I gained from Stuart was a certain kind of methodology that allowed one to work, if you like, on the present and on the recent past, on the, if you like, Foucauldian term, the history of the present, but in a way that was not over empirical, that wasn't, I mean, I'm not a historian, so this was not social history, it wasn't cultural history. But I think that what I gained from Stuart was the way in which Stuart used the Gramscian notion of levels, like how do we understand the situation, the conjuncture? And Stuart very clearly demarcated in his earliest work, for example, Placing the Crisis, that one can look at the political level, at political culture, if you like, and Stuart's work on satirism was the best example of that. But then also he looked at Blair, and then before he died, he was also looking at the government of David Cameron, the coalition government. But what Stuart allowed one to do was to kind of have a an edifice or a structure where you could trace political culture and you could trace changes in the economy and then also look at the cultural level or, if you like, ordinary, everyday life. Or, as I interpreted it in the book, The Aftermath of Feminism, what I was really looking at were the articulations between, the relationship between the political culture, which was the government and the time, the period of new labour, so that was political culture, and popular culture. And of course, this was the moment of Bridget Jones, of um, uh, female empowerment, and of what I described as post-feminism. So I was, it's interesting, it was more as though I had subconsciously absorbed so much from Stuart. It wasn't as though I was taking a template and applying it. It was just that it seemed to me this was the most conducive, the most the most useful way of trying to make sense of a series of phenomena that needed a more extensive explanation. 
The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. Thank you. And you just mentioned your, your 2008 book, The Aftermath of Feminism. If we could talk about that a little bit more. It's, it's kind of been recognised as a turning point for debates about post-feminism from years, say, 97 to 2007. It's one of the most cited texts in your entire back catalogue. Do you mind just kind of summarising the key concepts? And also, how do they connect with your more recent book, Feminism and the Politics of Resilience? Okay, so, well, this is... Uh... A big question, and I would um, begin to answer it by saying that the uh, the kernel of the argument in the aftermath of feminism is that within this conjuncture of new labor, political culture, and certain changes, certain kinds of new visual imagery, new genres in popular culture, one could see a close articulation between these two. They were in parallel. They were cross-referring. There was a a symbiotic relationship between the two. And the argument was that post-feminism referred to a moment made uh, realized in both political culture and popular culture, which implied that feminism could now be put to rest, that it was no longer needed that young women had become equal, that equality had been won, and that all the kind of angry feminist movement, the campaigns of the 70s, were no longer needed, and that instead we could look to a new time where a progressive government like New Labour looked after women, had women's interests at the forefront, but at the same time didn't any longer want to make reference to feminism, that that could comfortably put feminism, uh, if you like, uh, in the back burner or a kind of shell feminism. And I argued that this was a really kind of significant shift in lots of ways because it was as if Feminism had been taken into account. It had done the job that needed to be done, but now it was no longer needed. But more than that, there was a kind of hostility to feminism. That There was a, an insurgent, what I called a kind of insurgent masculinity, that we didn't need all that stuff. And I referred throughout the book to a kind of, it was as though feminism had become distasteful. It was associated with, um, grandmothers or with uh, school teachers or with kind of horrible figures from the 1970s um, and that uh, young women could really do without it and then I so the first that was that was really so that's what I meant by feminism taken into account but no longer needed and then alongside that I argued that There was a climate that developed which was based around female individualization process. And this was very much connected with the Blairite idea of the meritocracy. And, you know, we will give you the support. We will give you the level playing field. And then it's up to you to shine, to you to achieve your individual capacity. So I argued that the, this female individualization process came to shine a light. It's not as though young women were invisible. They were hyper-visible. They were kind of the shining light of attention on bright young women getting into university and with their A-level certificates. And this was sort of understood in terms of a kind of celebration of female achievement and capacity and success. So it was, it chimed very much with the idea of, you know, of of what was then, we didn't use the word neoliberalism so often then, but it was very much in 
tune with the emerging neoliberal economy, which was of the winner takes all, of um, you can make it and it's up to you and to work hard. So there was uh, the, the other, con- uh, other um, concept I used, so just two more concepts, and then we can finish with this question. Um, one concept was that I argued that New Labour were offering young women a new kind of sexual contract. And I wasn't using it in the legalistic or juridical sense that uh, Carol Pittman was using. I was using it in more a kind of Stuart Hall way. And I said that there was a sexual contract being offered to young women. And that was very much about becoming wage-earning citizens. So the deal was that young women were now on a pathway not to be at home and not to be dependent on a male breadwinner, but to be wage-earning themselves. So this was a kind of moment at which women were seen and young girls and young women were being uh, very much pushed towards, if you like, a career. So one part of the sexual contract was work and success in education. And another part of the sexual contract was a degree of, and this was post-feminist, in that it had drawn on feminism, but it didn't refer to feminism. And this uh, I defined as a kind of sexual freedom, that there would no longer be stigma or shame, that, young, that there would no longer be a sexual double standard, and that young women wouldn't be shamed if they had several boyfriends or if they you know, had good good fun out drinking whiskey and, you know, um, having one-night stands or being sexually free, as long as they didn't become single parents. So there was a sense of which sexuality was no longer subjected to the double standard. And this was, if you like, a kind of um, gesture towards feminism. And it was seen as a kind of equality. You can go out, have your fun, you won't be punished, you won't be seen as a slut or uh, whatever, you won't be shamed. And then the third part of the sexual con- of the um, of this sexual contract was that instead of being active as a citizen in politics, so New Labour weren't saying, young women, we want you to become involved in community politics, to stand as a local councillor and so on. No, no, it was very much about consumer citizenship and individual choice. And this was a kind of uh, runover or a kind of extension and a renewal and an update of Thatcherist discourses actually about choice, about being a parent. So if you were to be active in the community, it was like active in terms of um, parents' associations or uh, going to the gym or setting up a, a local entrepreneurial initiative um, based around consumerism, not round the dreary life of politics. It wasn't saying, OK, young women, this is how you get to become a councillor. And it would be really great to have more women in Islington Council or in Sheffield or Absolutely not. So it was this that led myself, but very many other people to talk about the depoliticizing logic of the Blair period of office, of New Labour. It was depoliticizing. It was just like go out and have fun, earn a good salary. It doesn't matter if you remain unmarried, but um, as long as you uh, kind of make this contribution to the economy by not being dependent on the state and don't become a single mother and don't even, you know, don't risk being reliant on welfare. Within this sexual contract, there were two images or what I would call figurations, which summed up this period. The young woman who was like what people used to call, you know, in the press, the ladder, the girl who was up for it, who would you know, happily go to lap dancing clubs with her boyfriend and drink whiskies and, and be free. I used the butler term. I, I called her a phallic girl. Mm-hmm. So butler talked about empowerment and the, uh, through her notion of the phallic lesbian, like taking up arms and taking on men in their, in their kind of um, domain 
and I use the word phallic girl to uh, describe this kind of pretense of equality, if you like, you know, the, the celebrity who is like a guy, who is like a lad, who will be up for it. I mean, in many ways, Love Island is the kind of hangover yes. of yeah. that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I used the word phallic girl. It was like a fake feminism. You know, it was fake empowerment. Uh, but the, the concept that I think actually had the most value and the most longevity was what I call post-feminist masquerade. And we probably don't have time to go into it, but again, I used Judith Butler and I used the psychoanalyst Jean Riviere from the 1920s. And what I argued was that this kind of way of being visible and coming forward came with certain kinds of requirements. And the requirements were that young women could be active in work and they could be successful but as long as they didn't actually threaten patriarchy and one way that that could be achieved they could be like a top doctor a top lawyer but uh but not in a way that really challenged the status quo and drawing on this 1920s psychoanalyst and then Judith Butler I came up with the idea of a post-feminist masquerade and what that was completely summed up in, uh, in TV programs like Sex and the City or Bridget Jones, where a hyper-femininity is used as a way of um, reminding the world that in being successful, you haven't lost your femininity and that deep down you still want a man, you still want baby, you still want a white wedding. And it was a kind of taking on a mask of hyper-femininity uh, to make sure that nobody got the wrong message. So you could be a top lawyer, but you would still have incredibly beautifully manicured nails and high heels that made you vulnerable in the street because you might fall over. And so there was a kind of taking on of a vulnerability that needed protection. And uh, I made the argument that this was a very interesting way of reassuring the status quo that you were not, in effect, reinventing or that you weren't really presenting or a new kind of feminism. It was never angry. It was always eager to please. It was like Carrie Bradshaw in Sex and the City. <laughs> there are so many examples. It was like Bridget Jones where she wears a really short skirt into work because she fancies Hugh Grant. And she's, her inner voice is saying, oh, I know really feminists would say I shouldn't do this, but what the hell? So that's what I meant by the post-feminist masquerade. I love that term. I love that term. And how, how does that connect up with the, your most recent work then? So Feminism and the Politics of Resilience, which is 2020. It all kind of ties up, doesn't it? Uh, it completely ties up. And this is quite a short book. It's just four essays and an introduction. And what I wanted to do in this book was to kind of introduce a wider social spectrum of which um, a wider social spectrum. What I mean by that is that in the aftermath of feminism, a lot of the argument was about was the emphasis on achievement and on winner takes all, or on what was often referred to as female success. And what I wasn't able to, and I didn't have the space to think about, was the other side, the kind of impact of social polarization that as young women did get into university and did achieve and did get jobs what about those who were excluded how what happened what about how were they treated what did it mean to be excluded from this ethos of the new meritocracy and i wanted to uh, show the way in which if you like, the kind of, well, what Bourdieu would call the symbolic and the real violence of this neoliberal ethos was, on the one hand, it was punitive to those who were on the pathway to succeed for all kinds of reasons. There were punishments there. But it was particularly, if you like, it invented new forms of punishment for, if you like, non-achievers, for 
uh, young women and women from low socioeconomic groups, from disadvantaged women, from working class women, who, for, from single parents who had several children, uh, particularly for women who were reliant on welfare and benefits. And this, this cruelty became all the more enhanced in recent years. And it was a kind of pejorative, uh, disparaging, often personalized attacks on women who were uh, vulnerable, who were unprotected, who were disadvantaged, and who were living in poverty. And the the ethos then became one of uh, blaming the victim or poverty shaming. And I linked the way in which, again, using Stuart Hall's kind of methodology, looking at how uh, in government there was a... Uh, a a real uh, campaign of anti-welfareism to shame people, if you like, out of welfare as an attempt to reduce the costs of welfare uh, to the state and to the taxpayer and so on. So I was tracing through the years of David Cameron and George Osborne and the way in which they used the rhetoric of poverty shaming and talking about people not not opening the curtains and uh, sleeping off a life on benefits was the famous phrase of George Osborne. And I looked at the way in which this took particular kinds of gender manifestations and the way in which distinctive parameters of shaming were directed towards women and how they were, if you like, exposed to a public gaze and how they were ridiculed or how they became victims of new forms of social media hostility for being overweight, for not being groomed, for not looking uh, for smoke, you know, all of this kind of stuff uh, that, that, that developed its own rhetoric if you like. And uh, of course, other feminists have been working on this. So the two chapters I focus on in the new book, I'm very much drawing attention to and really uh, pushing forward the work of many of my colleagues, uh, young colleagues and then colleagues who are slightly older. Of course, Beverly Speggs is the person that we uh, associate most with uh, this notion of working class women have to be respectable and this ethos of respectability. And what I'm arguing in in the book is it's not just being respectability, they've got to be glamorous. They've got to be, their bodies have now got to be in shape in a particular way. And if they can't do that and they can't afford that, then they get shamed. So there's Beverly Skaggs. There's, of course, Imogen Tyler and her most recent book, Stigma, and then there are younger scholars, Kim Allen and, uh, and various others who have been doing very good work. And what the, the focus of their attention has been, and this is again what I refer to in the book, the genres of TV. Of course, there are some that were much more uh, shocking and sensational, like Benefit Streets. But there was a genre of TV that was almost kind of seen as being perfectly... Um, social comment uh, and current affairs genres, but which actually also pushed forward this anti-welfare agenda by exposing people and drawing attention to, if you like, social abjection effect of women who were not able to clamber up the ladder. So in every, so the two chapters in that book, the two last chapters, very, very much follow the way in which political culture has a campaign to demonise people who are on welfare benefits. And this is followed through in popular culture with the growth of a range of TV and press genres, which in expose and shame people who are dependent on benefits. And I argue this is the essence of neoliberalism and it uh, it produces and reproduces social polarisation. It breeds the culture of hostility, of lack of compassion and of uh, an ethos of just looking after the self. And this is the world that we have ended up living in pre-pandemic 
where people who are um, doing low-paid, casualized jobs, uh, I talk about in the last chapters, I talk about how women, women in low-paid jobs suffer, if you like, what I call a triple incarceration effect. That is to say, the neoliberal economy has trapped them in a way that even no matter what they wanted to do and what they might aspire to do is physically and socially and economically impossible because the kinds of jobs that they are doing don't allow for flexible, okay, flexible hours, casual jobs, zero hours contract in behind the counter in a supermarket or packing clothes for a, a, a fast fashion company. Those jobs don't offer in-house training. They don't, even if you have the time to do training, they don't offer prospects. You can't really rise up a ladder. They don't have day release. And so there's an incarceration effect that the women are in these jobs and they've got to keep going and they can't up their salary. So they're trapped by low-paid jobs. They can't improve their qualifications. And they're also... Uh, trapped then by this shaming that they become more invisible because they can't see any way and they can't get out of this abject low status position. Um, so, and then the third effect is that the government over recent years has completely reduced access to further education. So yeah. there's no day release schemes. It's not as though they can easily do an open university course at night if they're on zero hours contract. So there's what I called a triple incarceration process. And that, that kind of, you know, maybe we could finish here, but that demonization and, and shaming is just feels like it's just become normalized and mainstream as well. Well, you know, that's an interesting question. One might argue that it has taken two momentous events mm. to interrupt at least or to expose to the public in a, with some degree of sensitivity and compassion the lives that low-paid workers, especially women and especially mothers with three or four children. And one of those events was, of course, Grenfell, and the second has been the pandemic. Yeah. And in both of those incredible events, we suddenly see and we suddenly hear the voices of these low-paid women who are working often on uh, below the uh, income level, before the, below the living wage, uh, long hours culture, cleaning hospital wards. And we also know that from Grenfell, uh, so many of the people who were living in Grenfell were working. They weren't jobless. They were working in local supermarkets. The men often were driving cabs. The women were working as cleaners. And uh, they were servicing in a way that Saskia Sassen talks about. They were part of the service sector, the service economy of London. But they were never given a voice. They were never seen. They were never listened to. And it was really only with the activism then post-Grenfell uh, by so many uh, Black Lives Matter, Black activists, Meghan Markle and various other people actually drew attention to the working lives of people living in poverty, the working poor. And then likewise with uh, the pandemic, the people that we know that were most exposed to the virus were often the women getting up at five o'clock in the morning to go to a cleaning job. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. I, I love your passion. I love your passion. I hope that was last year, wasn't it? That book came out. So I hope you've had a well-deserved rest as well. Oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you very much. Thank you. Just before yeah. you go, um, could, you said it on part one, but if you can just remind people where they can find out a bit more about your work as well. Uh, the best way to contact me is at Goldsmiths with my Goldsmiths email address. And actually, it's interesting that you asked me that question because what I'm now beginning to do uh, in the next six months is make available a good deal of the work that we've discussed. Oh, fantastic. Available on the Goldsmiths website as a PDF, free to download because, uh, you know, I don't want to really update it. I don't really want to go back to it, but I hope to have somebody helping me to turn it into PDFs 
with some images and maybe with a paragraph of introduction and it will be free to download. So that's one of my projects for the next six months. Fantastic. Brilliant. And thank you again so much for your time for both part two today, but also your previous part one as well, Angela. I really, really well, thank you. It. It's always been enjoyable speaking with you, Matthew. So I hope um, I hope it's enjoyable for your listeners. So Absolutely. thank you again. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show.